Snow Tracks is brought to you by Polaris. Think outside. Ski Do. Winter lovers get out there and experience that Ski Do feeling. And by Hercules Tire. Ride on our strength. Obviously, we've been waiting for a new platform from Arctic Cat for a long time, and finally, we have the Catalyst. But there's another reason that this sled is so important. The Catalyst and the new 858 motor represent the first time in nearly two decades Articat was able to develop both an engine and a chassis together. And this is important because it's the absolute best way to develop a sled. But I wanted to go deeper into the development of the motor and find out how it came together, what makes it special, and why developing it alongside the Catalyst chassis was such a huge benefit. So I got on a Zoom call with all the big minds at Articat all at once to get my questions answered. When we talk about how, you know, engines in the past and how they relate to platform, I'll go back in time a little bit, but when we did the Pro Cross chassis, it was using engines that already existed. You know, it, was, it wasn't just taking, you know, designing a new platform with a new engine in mind. It was taking the engines that we currently had and, it, and putting them into, this, into the Pro Cross, which replaced the old Twin Spark. So when the Catalyst platform started, it was, wow, we get an opportunity here where we can actually create a new platform along with a new engine. Meetings, PowerPoints, going back as far as middle of the last decade, right? 2015, 17, going, going back that far in a long time. We've looked at stand-up engines. We've looked at, you know, everything. We've put stand-up engines into chassis, just kind of rough models of what they look like. Everything has kind of come back to that laid on engine design, getting everything packaged, you know, as far down, as far back as possible. So it really, it was making an engine first that really works really, really well with the chassis. We also took into factor internal and consumer feedback on our current engines, on what people liked and what people didn't like about our current engines. It's no secret, some people don't like the way our 800 runs down at low speed. And that was a big one we wanted to change with the 858. So that was a huge thing we worked on, was the overall refinement of this engine package to be kind of one of our most refined engines to date. This is kind of one of the rare opportunities when we are able to really design an engine and a chassis kind of together, right, in conjunction with each other. So typically you're stuffing an existing engine into, you know, a new chassis or vice versa. So it was pretty unique and a pretty awesome opportunity to be able to design them, you know, purpose-built engine chassis combination for each other. Knowing the 858 engine was designed right alongside the Catalyst chassis, it's reasonable to wonder why we saw the 600 released first. Now, the 600 was always going to end up in a Catalyst chassis eventually, but there's more to the story about why the 600 was released before the 858. When there was some issues of actually being able to get the parts, it was like, well, we gotta make a decision. We either hold off on releasing the new Catalyst or we bring that 600 up because the 600 was also expected to be in the Catalyst platform. Uh, if you're gonna make a big splash in the market, that's that's what you wanna do is you wanna do the 858 first and then follow it up with the 600. But we knew how important it was to get this Catalyst platform into the market, not sacrificing anything. The decision was made to pull the 600 up and then to keep the 858 going. The 858 was the direction you know it was what we designed this chassis around and when push came to shove and we were looking at you know pushing off the catalyst another year or coming up with a different plan we put the 600 in there what we basically did is we positioned the 600 in there we had to consider how the 600 would mount in there without uh, making any changes to the case which influenced some of the the early on case designs of the 858 for engine mounting. So we positioned that, 
And then we said, okay, now in the 858 position, where do those holes have to exist on that case? The 858 was the ideal, perfect scenario. Deciding what displacement an engine is gonna be is so much more than just picking a number. There are countless factors that go into figuring out what the best choice is. And oftentimes, these factors all affect each other, complicating things further. It's working within our package to meet all the goals for the platform, but also still getting the performance that the consumer's gonna want. It's always a balancing act, right? You know, you have weight versus durability versus cost versus everything. We laid out 900s, we laid out even bigger engines. And really what, what happened is the weight really starts just, you get a point where the weight starts to skyrocket almost exponentially when you, when you get in bigger displacements like that. And that's just not something I wanted. It just doesn't work well with the chassis that we were laying out. A little bit of extra power you're getting for that extra displacement, um, you're getting a lot more extra weight for that small increase in horsepower. If we went to, say, a 900 engine, we would have had to increase, we felt we're going to have to increase our crank and diameters, especially if people are going to start boosting engines in the aftermarket. Same thing with if we increase the bore. Now, at an 85 millimeter bore, we can keep the same cylinder pitch side to side as what our 800 is. Um, if we start to get a bigger bore, 88 millimeter bore, our transfer ports are going to have to get bigger as well to um, you know, accommodate that extra airflow, which means the whole engine's going to have to get wider. Um, which again is not going to work well for a chassis. Maintaining our bore size helps our efficiency, which helps fuel economy, which helps overall package weight. Really, we just kind of found that point and, you know, 858 cc's was really kind of where we felt our engine was at a point of kind of diminishing returns, you know, for that displacement versus horsepower. We did have a target in mind, you know, based on where 800 is at and the percent increase. You know, our goals were about 10% over the existing 800. Mounting the 858 engine as low as possible in the catalyst chassis to help lower the overall CG of the sled was a major focus for Arctic engineers. But there's so much more to why the catalyst chassis handles so well than just where the motor is positioned. In our prototypes of what the catalyst might be, we also found, you know, in weight reduction projects and in different um, manipulations of our chassis and to see where we wanted to go, we, we, had, we built a lightweight sled up and we need to minimize these clearances. We need to get this as low in the chassis as we can. So, you know, we put the drive clutch on there in CAD and we said, okay, well, we know the drive clutch needs X amount of distance between the belly pan and, and that. So that determines where it can be. We decide, okay, now the engine mounting, we cast it in bosses right to the case to directly bolt the engine mount right to the case. Um, this allows the packaging for the lower frame to be unique and, and low profile. Took the specs of what Jeremy's team came up with and designed from the inside out. The A58 has quite a bit of interesting technology built into it, and one of the most interesting is the servo-driven exhaust valves. Valve height change is essentially controls the airflow through the, the engine. So we've increased the valve height change by 250 percent you can imagine it has a much greater control over the airflow through the engine on a scale of magnitude so it really allows us to manipulate how we want that engine to flow and run um, so the, the best number we have is uh, 250 percent increase in port height change for the for the exhaust valve system another benefit of this valve architecture is keeping that valve close to the piston surface throughout its uh, range of motion and keeping that close there makes it more uh, a more effective timing edge. And the, the more effective that timing edge is, the more, you know, that controls the airflow better, which then we can make higher efficiency, lower emissions, better run quality. This valve architecture opens us up to a large future. We have a lot of potential in this design. We have a new ECU with this engine. So this will be kind of just the starting point of a big future. Obviously, Articat didn't just design an incredible chassis and then say, hey, we better get a motor to throw in this thing. These components were designed for each other. And I can't wait to get my hands on an 858 Catalyst to see just how awesome this combination really is.
Trail Tech is sponsored by Princess Auto. Ideas. Tools. It's no surprise that the most anticipated sled on Flatland this season is this right here. The 2024 Skidoo MXZ XRS Competition Package with the 850 Turbo Two Stroke. It's an absolute monster of power and performance, but the truth is getting all of that power to actually hook up is the biggest problem that we've encountered because the reality of 180 plus horsepower and only 614 pounds ready to ride is absolutely zero possibility of anything but massive burnouts in stock form. Now the 137 inch Ripsaw 2 two ply track is 15 inches wide and it's got a 1.25 inch lug on it, but what you're not gonna find here is any pre-stud option. Why? Well, when it comes to this performance level, real studs are the real way to go. And with Skidoo delivering the turbo competition package with a two-ply track, they know that's precisely what you're gonna do with it. Put a bunch of studs in there. And guess what? That's what I'm gonna do too. With some help from Woody's, I'll show you how to reasonably stud and carbide up this new turbo so that we can get the most out of the two-stroke turbo and actually get some traction when we use the launch feature. Now, before I start, let me show you what I consider to be an absolute must have. And this is a Woody's studding template. These things are so cheap that you just gotta get one. And when you use this in harmony with one of the Woody's uh, marking pens, it, it makes your job so simple. And there's a template that's specifically designed to match the competition package and its pitch of 2.86 inches. Now I could run singles or doubles or a combo of both, but the Woody's suggested pattern uses both single and double support plates for a specific alternating four two stud layout recommended by Woody's for the 850 competition turbo. We will be using 144 studs total, which is a very healthy amount for this 137 inch track. And the double plates, which are more rigid, will help with initial launch and drag racing buddies down the lake. Now I've opted to go with the Gold Digger Traction Master Stud. It's 1.325 inches long and the lug on the track is 1.25 inches, so it's gonna stick out nicely. I also opted for the yellow powder coated single and double backers because it adds a lot of nice style and hey, it matches the yellow sled. The Gold Digger Traction Master studs are designed for two-ply tracks and are a very high quality push-through stud. They have a patented track trapping head that grips the track for ultimate hold and lifespan and are through hardened carbon steel with a 60 degree carbide insert for years of quality traction and grip. When you link these studs with the round digger two-ply aluminum support plates, powder coated in high-vis yellow, and the double support plates using the nuts that came with the studs, we have a setup that's ready to tackle the harshest terrain with potentially the most aggressive two-stroke ever built. Now, it wouldn't be a complete traction package if we didn't also upgrade the front carbide runners. So we're gonna do that, and I've got two options to show you. Now, if I'm looking for something a little bit tamer, I could go with the Trailblazer 5 6-inch carbide runner on a more traditional round-style host bar. Or if I like heavier front-end feel, the Executive utilizes a very similar host bar profile but increases carbide to eight inches per side. However, because I always feel the front end of a Skidoo to be anything but light on the ski pressure, I'm gonna go with the six inch carbide the Trailblazer 5 offers, giving me more than enough host profile and carbide grip if the trail gets icy or the lakes don't have enough snow. Now with the full setup installed, there's nothing better to do than take this thing out on the lake and see exactly what we've come up with. Prior to studying, I would do nothing but leave a polished skating rink when I took off. Now, I think things are gonna have changed quite a bit. Some of you are going to be tempted to throw 200 plus studs at this sled, but the 144 recommended by Woody's is a perfect balance between ultimate grip and reasonable rotating mass that won't negatively affect the handling. The turbo accelerates so hard that you wonder how you're going to hold on, and top speed grip makes me feel so much more in control. Even braking is confidence inspiring, where previously I'd be very aware not to lock up the track on the lower snow covered lake surface. Steering, I can tell, is much more precise, and this is now an overall very balanced traction kit for the Turbo XRS. I know that I'm going to be using the launch control a bunch this winter playing around on the lakes, and now we can confidently do so without the concern that we're gonna polish a curling rink for the cottagers or look like Muppets spinning our track and not going anywhere. Snow Tracks has been brought to you by Arctic Cat. Share our passion. Udaway Tourism. Snow covered landscapes to explore. And by FXR. Brings you more. There are two scenarios in my job 
that are the most difficult to deal with, especially when it comes to testing vehicles like snowmobiles. The first one is when there's nothing that I like about a snowmobile, that everything just seems wrong. And the second one is that there's nothing that I don't like about a snowmobile and everything just seems right. And this 2024 Skidoo MXZ XRS 850 E-Tech Turbo R is pretty darn close to the second one. Obviously by now this sled is no secret. Everybody knows all about it. My walk around video got pushing 70,000 views, maybe more by the time you guys see this. So this is no secret. However, it can't be understated how important this sled is in the industry and just how awesome it actually is. The more I ride it, the more I like it. The more I ride it, the more things I find to like about it. The 24 Skidoo 850 Turbo comes just in one package. There are no options and this is it. It comes in the XRS competition package with the 10 inch display. You cannot get smart shocks. This is what you get. With that said, this sled has all kinds of awesome upgrades and features that make it a really, really wicked ride on the snow. But the first thing I wanna talk about is obviously the most important of all of those things and that is the engine. This 850 E-Tech isn't your normal e-tech there's a lot going on under the hood the boost numbers they're running are slightly lower only because you're riding the sled at sea level it's tuned and has been set up to run at sea level skidoo has done a stellar job with this motor of making it extremely livable for slow rides for fast rides lake days trail days corner to corner you name it anything you want to do this motor's up for the task It's no secret that I'm not crazy about how your average Skidoo handles. They're getting better, but they're still not where I think they should be in terms of cornering through bumps and just general stability. With that said, this is the best handling Skidoo I think I've ever ridden. This sled handles bumps in the corners really well. It stays stuck to the ground. It steers even in loose conditions. It doesn't push. It's just got all kinds of really great handling characteristics that I've been waiting for on a Skidoo. Why does it work on this sled? So if you follow me down here, I think the secret is actually in the suspension. The arm motion on this sled has the competition package installed on it, which means it has a bunch of stiffening plates. It has solid rear wheels. It's got a, a bunch of extra stuff, but none of that stuff actually, in my opinion, makes it handle any different. That stuff can't affect the handling. It's when you come up front that it changes things. These front shocks are KYB Pro 40s. So this is the largest diameter shock shaft you can get on a Skidoo snowmobile. And it is beefy, let me tell you. This one with Pro 40s handles better than any of the other sleds in Skidoo's lineup. So we're starting to wonder if maybe the larger capacity shock with the larger shock shaft gives it some better tuning abilities or whatever it is, there's something going on there that makes these sleds handle better because the Pro 40 equipped MXZ XRS handles better than the Pro 36 equipped XRS. I can't tell you exactly why that is. All I can say is that in terms of Skidoo snowmobiles, this one handles the best. The front end works better through the bumps in the corners than any other Skidoo I've ridden. And of course, our motion out back rides just as good as our motion always does. It's just that you can pound this one harder without worrying about breaking it. Now, unless you've been living under a rock and you have no idea what this sled is, um, you probably already know that the turbo Skidoo comes with this methanol injection system. So what it is, is this tank holds a special mixture of methanol and water, and it is injected into the intake track after long periods of full throttle pulls. And the reason they do it is to help keep the intake air charge cool. The methanol water uh, mixture is burned off inside the cylinder, so it doesn't affect performance in any way, other than it keeps the intake air temperatures cool, which means you can maintain your 180 horsepower, which is what this engine makes, for extended periods of time. This mixture that XPS has come up with for this system is not like anything else on the market. XPS has come up with their own special blend of methanol and water with a special additive that stops foaming. And if you use anything else, the system isn't gonna work right. So just use the right stuff. Not only is this the best handling Skidoo snowmobile I've ever ridden, it's also the best braking Skidoo snowmobile I've ever ridden. There's no secret that I haven't liked Skidoo brakes for many years. However, Skidoo has fixed that problem this season with a new Brembo braking setup. What you're seeing down here is a four piston caliper. Now that's kind of a first in the industry and man does it work good, but that's not the only upgrade. Also on the bars, you've got a new master cylinder and a new adjustable brake lever. And this whole system working together, it is just a wild improvement over the last version of Skidoo's braking. And I gotta say, after putting many miles on this thing, I absolutely love it, it works great. And now I can't complain about Skidoo brakes anymore. 
There's a whole bunch of tricks hidden inside this sled, mostly related to the engine that you don't see when you first look at it. The first one is launch control. And Skidoo did this on their Ace 900 Turbo R last season, and everybody loved it. To be perfectly honest, I don't see it as a very useful feature. I don't think it actually makes you accelerate faster, but that doesn't matter at all because it is an awesome feature that's fun to use, it sounds good, and of course all your buddies will be jealous that you have it and they don't. The other piece of technology that is on this sled is something that Skidoo has hesitated to use or resisted using on their trail sleds for years now, and that is shot starting. And there's a reason why they use it on this sled, and the reason is this. This 850 Turbo weighs the same as a naturally aspirated 850 Skidoo XRS with electric start. So this one has electric start using shot, but it doesn't require battery, it doesn't require starter motor, all of those heavy components. Now that's a pretty impressive feat of engineering to use those systems to make this sled super lightweight and not really give you any penalties for having a turbo. While it is true that Skidoo wasn't the first to bring a two-stroke turbo to the trail market, the question will always be, did they do it better when they finally released this one? And that question remains to be answered. With that said though, they've done an excellent job. I have very little to complain about this sled. I like almost everything about it. And that's interesting because I haven't been able to say that about a Skidoo for many years. I think if you're the kind of person who wants that ultimate horsepower and appreciates very precise refinement and build quality, then this is a sled you should seriously look at.